Hi, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome. Good evening. Uh, this is the TIA Divest Zoominar on uh, TIA and divesting from fossil fuels. I'm really excited to have a bunch of great folks on with us tonight. Uh, many folks are just getting here, so we're going to wait a minute. Uh, I'm Drew Hudson from Friends of the Earth. Uh, I'll be doing a little bit of intro and uh, sort of level setting here as folks are joining. Um, we're really excited to have some great uh, guest speakers here, as well as folks who've been a part of the TIA campaign for several months um, and to get everybody caught up uh, on the status of the divestment movement and our work with TIAA, uh, a particular pension fund of uh, renown for many folks uh, from the academic and nonprofit sectors. Um, so we'll talk through a little bit of our agenda. Um, we'll have some time uh, later, we'll have some breakout groups in the call as well as some time for Q&A. Um, so for the moment, if you're just getting on, everybody is muted and we'd ask you to stay on mute uh, if you're not speaking. Uh, we will have some time for Q&A and chat later on. But if you want to, uh, if you're joining by computer, especially in the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says chat. You can click on that to open up the chat window on the right side of the Zoom meeting. Um, and please type in there uh, your name, uh, where you're joining us from, city or town or state, uh, whatever. Um, and if you are a TIAA customer or a, a member of an academic community that invests with TIAA, we'd love to know that too. Um, so you can just post in the chat uh, your name, where you're coming in from, and if you have a connection to TIAA, let us know that as well. Um, so, uh, Bill, why don't you go ahead and advance the next slide, um, and we'll get started here. Um, so, first of all, I want to really thank uh, our two fabulous guest presenters who are on uh, and hear more from in just a moment. Bill McKibben, uh, obviously a very well-known activist and author in our community, one of the founders uh, or sort of creators at 350.org. Um, and uh, also joining us tonight, uh, sort of in an expert presenter capacity, um, Caitlin Kreisel, uh, who's part of the Divest New York Coalition that we work a lot with at the TIA Divest Coalition, um, and who's gonna give us some particular insights into the investing world and the divesting world. We'll go ahead to the next one. Great. And then I also wanna um, thank and acknowledge all of our fantastic TIA Divest facilitators. Um, Bill Kish, who's running the slides right now, Carolyn Levine, uh, Britton, my coworker from Friends of the Earth, uh, Iris Bloom uh, from Protecting Our Waters, and Susan Van Dolsen. Um, all of these folks along with me have been working on the TIA Divest campaign for a couple of months now, um, and you'll hear more from us in the breakout groups and in the part of the agenda where we're talking about uh, what we've been doing so far to get TIA to divest and the pressure we've put on them. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about what we're doing tonight. So here's our agenda in a nutshell. Um, as I said, this uh, is the introduction part, so we can check that one off already. Uh, if you've just gotten here in the last minute or two, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us your name, uh, where you're Zooming in from this evening, and if you have a connection to TIAA, the big investment uh, forum, uh, let us know that if you're a customer or you're part of a university community that invests with them. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, and we are keeping track of the chat, so if you have questions as presenters are going along, feel free to type those in the chat as well, and we'll circle back to them during our Q&A a little bit later. Uh, so we'll hear first from Bill uh, McKibben and from Caitlin uh, to kind of set the, the level on what's been going on with divestment in New York and around the world for the last few weeks. We'll talk specifically about our campaign to get TIAA to divest and our demands for them. Uh, we'll talk about some recent happenings on the campaign, some recent pressure and interactions we've had with the board and the staff. Um, and then we'll uh, break out into some strategy groups. So we'll tell you a little bit of what we've been working on in terms of strategy, and we'll give you a chance to weigh in on that and pick to be sort of a choose your own adventure moment where you can opt into different groups uh, and be part of the campaign in different ways. Um, we'll come back together at the end of the breakout groups. We'll have some Q&A uh, at that point as well. If you have questions uh, or if you don't get uh, answers or ideas in the breakout groups, you can do it at the end. Um, and we'll also have some next steps, things you can do coming out of this call. The plan is for the whole thing to wrap up uh, by about 8 o'clock. Um, so we'll be uh, through the, the presenting part uh, probably in the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, and we'll be uh, through with everything by 8 p.m. So uh, with that, I think uh, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Bill McKibben, 
uh, a fantastic leader of our movement, uh, commonly regarded as the author of the first uh, sort of public, public education book about the climate crisis, uh, but has written many more things since then. Uh, and without further ado, I'll let Bill introduce himself and what he's been up to recently uh, more. Bill, take it away. Well, true, old friend, many, many thanks for that introduction. What a pleasure to get to join everybody here. What a pleasure in particular to get to be the table setter for Caitlin tonight, who's gonna do the real work of uh, uh, bringing us along on this part of the campaign. I'm just gonna talk for a minute about where we are um, in this vast divestment campaign, which taken all together is probably the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history, biggest thing of its kind. Um, first off, let's just orient ourselves for a second and um, remind ourselves what's going on. As we sit here right now, the five, five of the 10 biggest fires in California history are currently burning, and there are six, count them, six hurricanes stretched out across the Atlantic. Um, sometime today, we're going to hit the last letter in the regular hurricane alphabet and start in on the Greek alphabet for the next round of hurricanes that are coming. Um, we saw the highest temperature ever recorded on planet Earth six or seven weeks ago in Death Valley. Um, we're in a world of hurt, and of course, the people who hurt the most and hardest are the people who've done the absolute least to cause the fix that we're in. We don't always see their stories because there's not as many cameras, but we're working through the worst flooding season probably in African, modern African history right now. Hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed, a quarter of Nigeria's rice crop wiped out, on and on and on. So that's the world that the fossil fuel industry has created. Uh, that's the world that we could have started fixing 30 years ago had they not started this massive campaign of disinformation that kept us locked forever uh, in this current stasis. So divestment. I was talking earlier today with my, just about my oldest and dearest friend, Naomi Klein, um, and we were remembering the beginnings of this divestment campaign eight years ago. The two of us had each separately read the same small obscure study from a London consultancy called Carbon Tracker Initiative. And it, um, it set forth the most interesting numbers I'd seen in 30 years of working on climate change. Uh, it added up how much carbon the fossil fuel industry had in its reserves and compared it with how much scientists said we could safely burn. And what do you know, it was five times as much. These, it turned out, were rogue companies. If their business plans were carried forward, there was no drama. The end of this story was written and the planet was going to burn up. We started talking about how we might address that and both of us Harken back to our own college days when the subject had been apartheid in South Africa and the divestment movement was a huge part of solving it. When Nelson Mandela got out of prison, his first trip was to the US and not to the White House. It was to Berkeley to thank students from across America for the role that they'd played in that divestment. So that's what we started thinking about and we planned uh, this do the math tour across the United States. Naomi immediately became pregnant, so she didn't come along for the most part. We did uh, 29 cities in 30 nights, and by the time we were done, there were 400 college divestment campaigns underway. And then the same thing in Australia and New Zealand and across Europe, and, and that was the kind of beginning of this. And really, it was a brilliant idea because like that famous, I don't know if any of y'all are Mark Twain fans, but there's that scene in Tom Sawyer where he starts whitewashing the fence and makes it look like so much fun that everybody else comes along and does the actual work and he just sits there and uh, 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 relaxing. Um, that's really been my story for the last 10 years. Uh, everybody else has done all the work all over the world, place after place after place. The original insight was that most of us don't have oil wells or coal mines in our backyard, but we're all connected in some way or another to pots of money, university endowments, our pension funds, through church groups, whatever. And 
So there have been 10, 20, 30,000 campaigns around the world around divestment. Some of them, have, many of them now have won. In fact, it's at $14 trillion and counting in endowments and portfolios, by far the biggest corporate campaign of its kind in history. Uh, you know, and it just moves from one victory to another at this point. I mean, in the last year, the University of California system divested its massive uh, 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 pension and endowment fund, 80 or 90 billion dollars. Oxford University, most famous university in the world. Cornell, Brown, um, um, you know, just on and on and on. In the last few months, both the Pope and the Queen have come out for divestment, which leaves us, as far as I can reckon, with only Beyonce left to claim, you know, as a kind of champion. And if we can get her, then we're almost done, I think. But um, the beauty is that as the campaign builds, uh, its effectiveness keeps rising. When Naomi and I started, frankly, we thought the job was merely to try and take away what we were calling the social license of the fossil fuel industry, to put some tarnish in its image. And certainly it's done that. We've weakened its political power that way. But it's gotten so big now that, that it's doing real financial work. Um, last year, Shell Oil said that divestment had become a material risk to its business, which was a very heartening thing to hear because Shell Oil's business is a material risk to the planet on which we live. Uh, earlier this year, before COVID, back in the before times in January, um, some of you may occasionally watch Jim Cramer, the America's favorite stock picker, this uh, uh, kinetic fellow who goes on the screen and yells at you about which stocks to buy and not and things. And, and he devoted a program to explaining that there was just no point anymore in trying to make money off oil company stocks because there was too much divestment going on. Divestment had gotten too big, was what he said. Um, and that was very powerful and heartening to hear. That's why we've got to keep the pressure on, why we've got to keep pushing. This is working in profound ways. What it's doing is weakening the political standing of these companies and their ability to do what they do. And that's the single biggest obstacle to progress. You know, it's not like we don't know what we need to do about climate change. And it's not like it's not possible. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, the price of a solar panel or a wind turbines dropped 90% in the last decade. This is the cheapest way to generate power on our planet. So we could do what we needed to do if we could move the dead weight of this industry out of the way. And that's why what you all are about tonight is so important. Nobody signs up for their TIAA pension in the expectation that they're helping wreck the planet. In fact, if you think about it even for a minute, the irony of putting, putting pension money into stocks that all but guarantee there won't be a planet on which to retire is, is so enormous that it barely bears considering. Not only that, I mean, one reason this campaign's gotten easier over time is because it's become abundantly clear to everybody that, uh, you know, um, despite ourselves, uh, Naomi and I and all the other uh, people who started doing all this, we're, we're, we're uh, a better financial analyst than we knew. Uh, fossil fuel stocks have performed terribly. They're the worst performing part of the economy over the last decade. Uh, if you were ex-fossil fuels 10 years ago, you made out like a bandit this decade if you, were, you know, had funds invested in anything. Um, so so it's, it, is, it is a matter of spreading the word as wide as we can. And when that word spreads, then we will be powerful enough to to change TIA CREF, which is no small target, man. This is one of the biggest boxes of money on planet Earth. And y'all have the chance to leverage it to, so that, to the point where it is doing enormous good. The message that it would send, it will send, when TIA CREF does the right thing, is going to be loud and clear. It'll be one of the signal events. It'll be like the day in 2014 when the Rockefeller family divested the world's original oil fortune from fossil fuel. Uh, you know, it'll have an impact like that because, well, among other things, 
many of the most educated, noisy, and outspoken people on the planet will hear about it because it's their money that's at play. So I just cannot thank everybody enough. I'm eager to help in any way, though I'm very glad that you guys are doing all the heavy lifting. Um, and, and I'm going to turn things over now to Caitlin, who is a real star of this work, uh, who knows from her work as a public official uh, just how important it is, um, and, 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 and who knows a hell of a lot more about money and finance and what we should be doing with it than me. That is for sure. So thank you all, and, and Caitlin, uh, over to you, and such thanks for your leadership. Phil, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, keep that sentence you just said and and just keep it on repeat for the rest of my professional career. Thank you so much. Um, and um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me uh, this evening. Um, I'm really happy to be a part of this big room. And, and it's nice to see everyone's faces, too. That makes it feel like we're actually all together, even though we're um, unfortunately unable to do so. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so just let's see what I can. Give me one second. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Okay. So I tried to do the big presentation style, but it would have made it so that I couldn't have had the Zoom screen up at the same time. So you're going to see. Um, kind of my, my rough slide deck here. Um, and if anyone has any questions as I go through my presentation, um, I've got the chat box open. Um, so please just let me know uh, what questions you have. Um, I will try to answer those as I go. I, I'll, I'll try to multitask to make sure that I'm uh, watching as we go through the presentation here. Um, so my name is Caitlin Creasel. I am a first and foremost, I'm a financial advisor with Hanson's Advisory Services, which is located just outside of Syracuse, New York. Um, and we do all socially responsible investing and fossil fuel free investing is a really big part of what we do. Um, in addition to my role at Hanson's, I also founded a not for profit uh, called the Sustainable Economies Alliance, which is um, which just launched our podcast this morning all about sustainable finance. Um, and that's called Sustainify. So follow us on Twitter. Um, and then I'm a, one of the lead organizers of Divest New York, which has really been um, an awesome opportunity and a really great way to get involved at a bigger level because to divest the New York state pension from fossil fuels would be one of the greatest things that we could achieve um, in terms of the domino effect of actually really um, getting some of the, um, the work done all around the world that we need to do if we're going to address climate change and, um, and build really uh, emphasize that, which I think is, it's really, you know, why we're all here. It's, it, it's this is a tool to mitigate climate change. Um, and then I am um, a town councilor in my community. I'm on the Manlius Town Board. Most of you have probably never heard of it, but uh, we're going to be supporting fossil fuel divestment with a resolution uh, coming up soon. So we're, all my worlds kind of align with each other. All right, so um, the, the thing that I want to talk about with all of you here this evening um, is uh, the Department of Labor and ERISA and then fiduciary obligations. So within the fossil fuel divestment movement, um, there is, uh, there's always this question that we get, um, what about fiduciary obligation? Um, and and it's, it's used um, in all these different pools of money. You've got endowments, you have uh, the New York State Pension Fund, um, but then you also have employer-sponsored plans. Those work a little bit differently. So when we're talking about divesting TIA CREF, um, we're, we're really talking about uh, the Department of, La Department of Labor and ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. So when you're, when you're trying to determine what you can do, what are the options that you have available to you, how can you go into a retirement plan like TIA and actually compel them to divest from fossil fuels. Um, it's really the Department of Labor and ERISA that regulate the options that you have. So when you have a um, when you have a retirement plan like Tia Craft, you're really you're really kind of beholden to the rules as they're written. Um, and so I want to I want to start with actually a rule that's not quite written yet, but that's currently proposed. Um, and this is. 
uh, Donald Trump's uh, DOL um, is trying to put forward, put forward a new rule that would make it extremely, extremely difficult, if not impossible, to include ESG or environmental social governance screened funds inside of a retirement plan. Um, normally, you have 90 days, um, 60 to 90 days to, uh, to comment on the rules. They only gave 30. They did it really, really fast. Um, and it was, um, it, was not, um, it was not really given the time that it needed to have enough people comment and to come out against it. And, um, and I actually wanted to bring up, um, can you see this? Is it still on the presentation or can you see the link? Okay. Um, so at a time when virtually the entire investment world has acknowledged that ESG risks and opportunities are relevant material considerations for investors, the U.S. Department of Labor has proposed a rule that would limit the ability of retirement plans to include funds that integrate ESG factors into their investment processes. Um, and I can link to this article so that you can read it in full. Um, but there was one thing that I wanted to draw your attention to. I should have highlighted this because now I'm going to be scrolling for like five minutes while I have 100 people watching me. Um, <clears throat> there's a piece here where it said that Donald Trump wanted to see why. Yeah, see, I'm not going to be able to find it. I'm going to send you, the, I'll put this link in my notes or in the comments so that you can look at it. But it, it draws attention in this article to the fact that Donald Trump was trying to find ways to support the fossil fuel companies and to, um, to come out against ESG for the pure purpose of supporting the fossil fuel industry and investment in the fossil fuel industry. Um, so this article, it was, uh, was really interesting to read how Trump was so interested in, um, in supporting the fossil fuel companies and not acting in the best interest of the participants in these plans. Um, so when we talk about the, um, when we talk about these plans and we talk about divesting from them and we talk about the options within them, when you are an employee of a company and you sit down on that first day um, with your HR rep or whomever it might be, um, and you're a professor at a university or you're, you're employed at a, a college, um, and they sit you down, they give you all those investment options that, that you get to choose from. And a lot of people don't really understand where those, where those funds come from, who picked them, how do those funds work. And so how it's supposed to work is you're supposed to have funds that are available to you that are in your best interest. And this, is, this comes from something called the fiduciary obligation or fi the fiduciary rule, that the people making the decisions are acting in your best interest. They're acting in the best interest of the beneficiaries of the fund and not in their own interest. And so you have available to you the options that they've presented to you, that they've picked on your behalf. So when we're talking about the, um, the options that you have, it would make sense that there would be a line of options that met your values, that were fossil fuel free, that were, that were doing right by the environment, that have uh, women and people of color in executive positions within those corporations um, that are manufacturing safe products, paying their employees a living wage, and on and on and on. But it's not always the case that those funds are available to you in your 401k. Most 401ks don't have any of those options at all. And it's really unfortunate that that's the case because ESG investments have historically outperformed traditional investments. So ESG stands for environmental social governance. And when you're, when you're picking funds outside of a 401k, just in, a, in your in an IRA that you have outside of your employer or a non-qualified account outside of your job, you're able to pick those ESG funds and those funds are performing better. Fossil fuel free funds are performing better. So why are they not being included in the retirement plan? And how can uh, the fiduciaries on the plan say that they're acting in your best interest by presenting options to you uh, that are not performing as well as others? So if they say, well, it's our fiduciary obligation to maximize return or it's our legal obligation to act in the best interest of the people that are benefiting from this pool of money, 
um, then they absolutely should be including ESG funds or fossil fuel free funds in that mix because they have outperformed and they are performing, performing extremely well year over year. So as this is a fossil fuel divestment presentation, I want to talk specifically about how fossil fuel companies are performing. So when I'm in person and I can only see like five heads, so I can't get like the whole, um, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole room here, but I normally like have a show of hands, like who here thinks that fossil fuel companies are performing really, really well right now. And who here, who here thinks that they're probably not performing that great. And who here thinks that they're performing really, really badly. So raise your hand in your own head, know where you stand. And then um, here is the damage. Here is, here is the current state of affairs. And this is as of today. So I, I ran this report today. So we have here this blue line, this GSPC, that's the S&P 500. And this is over the course of the last year. Um, and you can see how it's performed 12.5% give or take. Then you've got BP, Chevron, and ExxonMobil, respectively, that over the course of the year, they have lost 37%, 48%, and 50%, respectively. So not performing all that well. So if you raised your hand for performing pretty terribly, then you were right, so you, you win. Um, and then this little green line here, this GCEQX, that is um, a green century fossil fuel free index fund that has outperformed not only all of the fossil fuel companies at quite, quite a bit of difference, but also um, it has performed uh, in, it, and is superior to the S&P 500. So that's over the last year. So then they say, oh, well, that's just the short term, Kaylin. Like it's not, you know, like the, what's a year in the grand scheme of things? And so I always enjoy doing this. Well, let's look at the 10 year. <laughs> September 16th, 2010 to se September 16th, 2020. Um, I'm pretty sure that the writing is on the wall. That money talks, the numbers are clear. Um, fossil fuel companies are not performing well at all and the fossil fuel free fund has outperformed all of the other options um, over the 10 year. So if you're saying that you have a fiduciary obligation, a legal obligation to maximize return and a legal obligation to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries of a pool of money, of a retirement plan, for example, then perhaps you should be offering funds that are performing um, vastly better than the other options that are available to you. So uh, something else to kind of drive this home a little bit. We compare fossil, we compare financial performance of investment portfolios with and without fossil fuel company stocks over the period 1927 to 2016. It's a pretty long time. Contrary to theoretical expectations, we find that fossil fuel divestment does not seem to impair portfolio performance. Uh, these findings can be explained by the fact that so far fossil fuel company stocks do not outperform other stocks on a risk adjusted basis and provide relatively limited diversification benefits. And that's from a study titled Fossil Fuel Divestment and Portfolio Performance. So if we were to look at an option inside Tia Kref that actually included ESG, um, there is one option, the Social Choice Fund, and it's a great fund, but you can't be invested in all one fund. And when you have dozens of other options and none of them are ESG, that's greatly limiting the diversification that's available inside of your retirement plan. And it's not acting in the best interest of the beneficiaries of that plan. Um, and so one of the questions that I know that the Divestia folks have is, can we get Tia to divest fully. And I think that that's a goal that you can certainly seek to achieve over, you know, I wouldn't even say the long term, I would say kind of the interim. Um, I think some lower hanging fruit in the near term might be to ask Tia to add more ESG funds in different sectors. So not just social choice, the very general stock fund, but also international emerging markets, um, sustainable bond funds that, that finance green infrastructure. There's dozens and hundreds of options available now, and TIA has the analysts and the tools available to do that. Um, also during the um, pandemic, um, one of the things that we were watching, how would sustainable funds outperform? Um, and they, they performed um, better during the downturn. They mitigated risk on the downside. Uh, so 
like it, what I normally do when I'm meeting with my own clients is I just pull up a Google search bar and type ESG and performance and just pull up whatever is the most recent because the, the answers are in ESG is a mitigation strategy. You're investing in companies that are inherently resilient because they're investing in their people. They're investing in their communities. They're investing in their environment and those that environmental social governance risk that they're analyzing. And these are the funds that you could seek to include in TIA um, have performed better and they are they aren't, they aren't, they don't perform as bad when the market goes down and then they perform better when the market goes up. So getting back to that fiduciary case, that legal obligation, because that's really the question that, that is going to keep coming up. And that's the pushback that um, Tia is going to keep sending that they can't just do what is socially good because um, they need to. Uh, they need to do what's in that best that best interest, even if it's not good for the environment or whatever else it might be. Um, so this is a really, really great report that I would absolutely encourage you to read. A trillion dollar transformation, fiduciary duty, divestment in fossil fuels, and an era of climate risk. Uh, to keep this short, I'm not going to read these whole paragraphs that I've highlighted here. Um, but I will. I can make my presentation available as well for people to take a look at later. Um, but what I will emphasize here, um, the cleanest and simplest way to avoid climate vulnerability in a portfolio is to divest. So acknowledging what we're facing on this planet and knowing that the, that the, I mean, look at what's happening in California right now. Look at what happened in Australia last year. You don't think that insurance companies and and car manufacturing companies and, um, and, and dozens of others that are in sectors of the economy directly impacted by this, you don't think that they are being impacted by climate change, then you're wrong. So these things are very much going to affect stock performance in companies going forward. And so the only, if we were, if we acknowledge that fact, that scientific based fact, then we know that the only way to mitigate inside of that portfolio, the only way to mitigate that risk is to divest from the companies um, that are that are going to bear the brunt of that. And that is going to be companies that are the, that are the big historical energy companies that we're all familiar with. Now, the world is listening. People are paying attention to this. Um, I was sitting in a presentation. I was supposed to be learning how to govern when this uh, popped up in front of me and my jaw hit the floor. Um, when, when BlackRock, the largest money manager on the planet, trillions of dollars money manager, said that the climate crisis is here, it will reshape finance in the future, and that in, in their, some of their managed accounts, uh, they would be divesting from fossil fuels. Um, a little bit greenwashing, but still the facts are there, and for BlackRock to even come out and say this, I think was extremely important. If a company like BlackRock is saying that, then TIA should not be far behind. And if they're still saying that fossil fuel investments are the way to go, just send them the New York Times article and have Larry Fink give them a call. Because if Larry Fink is saying it, then they might, they might try to play catch up. And um, one of my, okay. Yeah, that's another Larry Fink thing, but I'll skip that for now. So, um, the if fossil fuel divestment is the way forward, Larry Fink is on to something. Um, so is the rest of the planet. $14.38 trillion, this is as of today, have been committed to fossil fuel divestment. Tia Kref should be a part of that number, not in opposition to that number. And at the very beginning of my presentation here this evening, I referenced Donald Trump's attempt to uh, undermine the DOL's ESG rules. Um, and it wasn't just me that came out against that and submitted my thoughts. Um, overwhelmingly, there was opposition to his new rules, his proposed rules inside of the um, inside of the DOL and allowing there to be ESG funds inside of retirement plans, ERISA covered retirement plans. Um, so the author of this article says, somewhat surprising to me was the level of opposition was equally as high among investment related firms and organizations. Of 229 comments from investment professionals, 94% were opposed 
to the proposed rule and only 2% were in favor. Asset managers were nearly unanimous in their opposition with only one out of 86 comments in favor of removing the option of having ESG in their, uh, in their retirement plan. BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street Global Advisors, T. Rowe Price, and Vanguard all said that ESG should be included in retirement plans. So my opinion is that in the near term, TIA, Divest TIA should be paying very close attention to um, the DOL's proposed rule, because if that comes out, it'll be much more of an uphill battle. Uh, the, the comment period is closed, but call your Call your local official, call your state um, and, and federal officials and, and your congressman and try to get them to, uh, to come out against this because it's going to be extremely detrimental to retirement plans around the world or around the country. Um, and then in the interim, focusing on ESG, including those in the uh, retirement plan and then over the long term, uh, continue to push for rules and regulations inside of that fiduciary law that would allow TIA to, to become um, fossil fuel free. That's the end of my presentation. I actually couldn't see the <laughs> chat box ever during this whole thing. So maybe if I stop sharing my screen, I'll see the chat back up. Okay. So let's see. So, okay. Feel free to scroll through there. There's, there were a few questions and, and mostly comments, um, people asking to get your slides afterwards. So I know we'll send that after. So yeah. Why don't we go ahead and, and jump over to Bill um, and uh, TI Divest crew, and they can kind of update folks on what some of what we've already been doing, presenting some of these same demands to TIA um, and why we're doing that. Uh, and then we'll circle back uh, right after breakout groups as well. You can ask questions in your breakout groups, and you can also come back right after. Uh, if we didn't get something, type it in the chat, and we'll, we'll come back and answer it right after. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Drew. Um, okay, I want to make sure that I have my screen sharing set up correctly. So, okay, you see, you see the slides, but not my notes and all that good stuff. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Kish, and I'm a software engineer by profession, and I'm an organizer here at TIA Divest. I know that some of you were with us for our first webinar um, last April, and these next few slides are going to look familiar to you. Um, I just want to provide some background for people who haven't uh, seen this before. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about TIAA and hopefully get it out of the way quickly. Uh, TIAA is the largest uh, provider of financial services for workers in education, research, the arts, and not-for-profit organizations, and the government. They have over 5 million individual clients spread out over 15,000 participating institutions, giving them access to over a trillion dollars. So a trillion dollars is larger than the GDP of 80% of the countries in Europe, if you want to consider, you know, in, in scope. And by the way, TIAA's investment management arm is called Nuveen, um, and I'll be referencing Nuveen um, more as we go forward. All right, if you take a look at TIAA's materials, you get a strong message of social responsibility, and that message is always front and center. You're likely to feel really good about TIAA when you listen to TIAA. Here's another, um, I feel really good about TIA now, don't you? They're not advancing, Bill, your slides. My slides aren't advancing? Mm. Really? That's, that's thanks. Um, there we go. Well, this isn't, that isn't what I wanted to have happen though. So that's, that's <laughs> disturbing um, because now I've got this in two different, um, all right, well, I'll try and figure out how to make this work. Um, so, jump, so jumping back, just so you can see um, real briefly, um, here's, here's an example of some TIAA language that they, uh, they like to use. Um, and um, here's some more language that they like to use. Um, their executives really know how to talk the talk, um, and I think that everyone can feel good about this message. But, um, Here's the reality. Um, I'm sad to say that it's all greenwash. TIA actually has $10 billion invested in fossil fuel companies. They paid to build a frac, uh, pack, some frac gas power plants in Ohio and New York, and one of these plants is actively fighting renewable infrastructure in New York State. TIA claims that it's their fiduciary responsibility to include fossil fuel stocks in their portfolio. 
But one look at the stock market over the past couple of years demonstrates that these are terrible investments. So TIAA's trillion dollars of economic power is very dangerously impacting the energy economy, which makes them a very dangerous company. I have to switch this and then you can see. TIAA um, is invested in all these big bad companies, um, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Halliburton, Kinder Morgan, Marathon Oil, Schlumberger. Um, if you've done any work on the front lines of the fracking fight, uh, pipeline fights, or the climate fight, you know these names. Uh, these are the companies that are driving the climate emergency right now. Um, as Kaylin mentions, they're, they're terrible investments. So here is the poster image for TIAA's climate violence, the Cricket Valley Energy Center. In this case, TIAA didn't just buy stock in a frack gas power plant, they actually paid to build the plant. And now they own a major share of one of the largest frack gas power plants in the Northeast. Cricket Valley's, uh, the Cricket Valley plant's owners, um, including TIAA, are fighting New York State's plan to build out an advanced electric grid to support renewable energy. And TIA won't even discuss reversing this plan. So that's, um, you know, that drives me nuts in any event. Uh, one of the saddest facets of TIA's investment strategy has been their focus on buying large swaths of land all over the world. TIA have not been good stewards of this land, and they're contributing to deforestation, extinction, and genocide of indigenous peoples. Our partner in this fight, Friends of the Earths, Earth have been uh, pressuring TIA to stop, and we're joining their fight as they've joined ours. These are our core demands for TIA. Um, they must divest from all of their fossil fuel infrastructures. Uh, they need to unload Cricket Valley Energy. We want that plant closed. Uh, we want them to stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure. And finally, TIA must implement no deforestation policy. Okay, so now we've gotten the, uh, the, the, the background out of the way and we're ready to talk about what's happened since our last webinar. Um, we were able to quickly recruit 75 climate focused groups to sign on to our demand letter to TIA's board and CEO. And we delivered that letter to TIAA and got it to their attention. Um, by June, we had a video conference scheduled with TIA's responsible investing team, and we made sure that we were well prepared for it. The meeting took place on July 10th, and four Nuveen subject matter experts were on the line, including Megan Fielding, their director of responsible investing. We explained our demands, and we focused on the following areas. We tried to get TIAA uh, slash Nuveen to explain the disconnect between their public messaging and the harmful realities of their investing practices. We could tell they were uncomfortable with the cognitive dissonance there. That, that was definitely something that, uh, that we felt in the conversation. We explained that their clients want a real environmentally responsible retirement option, and they promised to follow up with more details, which became one of the running themes of the meeting. Um, and we drilled down on TIAA's direct investment in fossil fuel infrastructure particularly the Cricket Valley plant. We tried to learn why TIA spent their clients' money to build in this environmental disaster and probed to see if they understood the true impact of their investment on climate and health in the surrounding communities. We didn't get any answers, but they promised that answers would be forthcoming. Uh, here's a trigger alert. If anyone here is frightened by weasel words, there are a lot of them in this slide. Yes, I know there was a ferret, um, but the point is that after four months of diligent effort to engage with TIAA and Nuveen, the best they can manage to provide is this condescending weasel worded response. I'll try to translate, um, even though my weasel is a little stale. Um, for the first point, um, TIAA um, and Nuveen believed and still believes that fracked gas, natural gas, methane, or whatever you like to call it, is a responsible source of electric power. 
even though science has demonstrated that this gas is at least 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas over a 20 year period. So I don't know how you can claim that it's a responsible fuel. Regarding Cricket Valley plant, um, TIA tried to sell it at a profit when the writing was on the wall that the plant was becoming a stranded asset. But once it became embarrassingly obvious that they would have to take a huge loss, they stopped trying. Regardless, TIA will lose money on this deal but we think that they should get out now. And finally, TIA reiterates their stance that they don't wanna consider any divestment. Uh, one TIA executive told us off the record, everyone wants us to divest from something. Well, this something is an existential emergency. We all need to force TIA to understand that reality. And by the way, we never got any of the follow-up answers that Naveen promised. So now we're at a turning point. We tried to engage with TIAA on their terms and you saw the results. We're ready to start battling TIAA on our terms and here are our assets. We have 75 strong allied groups who will help us spread the word about TIAA's irresponsible practices. We've got almost 300 signatures on our petition, but we really need your help to get us to 1,000. Please, please help us with that. Um, we've got Bill McKibben and Caitlin Creasel on our side. Yay. Um, we've got all of you um, who've joined us today to help us prove that TIAA is not an immovable object. And we learned something absolutely critical. TIAA really wants to believe that they're the good guys. And their circuits start to overload when they're shown evidence that this isn't, isn't the reality. And we can use this to help change TIAA's mind, even if we have to do it one employee at a time. With all that said, um, I'd like to introduce Caroline um, to talk about how we can make TIAA divest. Thanks, Bill. And hi, everybody. Welcome. It's so exciting to see so many of you attending this seminar. Um, my name is Caroline Levine. I'm in the English department at Cornell University and inspired uh, not least by Bill, Kiv Bill McKibben, who presented to us uh, a year and a half ago at Cornell. We, a group of us, kind of a loose group of us, um, really struggled for divestment to get Cornell to divest from fossil fuels this past year, and we succeeded. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons I joined this fight for TIA divest is that I really think we can succeed with this too, um, and for some of the same reasons. So a lot of us, a lot of people told us when we started at Cornell not to bother, or a lot of reasons why we shouldn't do this work, um, including the fact that we tried to get Cornell to divest four years before and it was too soon and those same trustees were on board and all of that. Um, but we had some inside knowledge that there were people squirming inside the administration at Cornell and we have that same sense at TIAA that people are feeling really uncomfortable with what's um, going on inside their own house, um, especially the people who are kind of responsible for sustainability. So we think we can win this fight. We've got so much momentum behind us. Um, this is just a list of, you know, some of the many institutions that have divested over the last few years. Um, and, you know, um, the University of California system was a huge one. Uh, the Episcopal Church, obviously having the Pope behind divestment is huge. Um, Bill, could you go forward one slide, please? That. Yeah, there we go. So what's in our way? Well, we've seen TIA is really stodgy about this. They keep saying, no, we have to continue with what we've been doing uh, so far, business as usual. Secondly, they're really resting on their reputation as a socially responsible business. And so I think very few TIA clients know how bad their investments are. Um, and because they tout their social responsibility everywhere, um, it's very unclear to us um, that they're actually investing, for example, directly in fracked gas plants. Um, I didn't know that. And then the claim of fiduciary responsibility. They're constantly saying, look, we have to do, we have to invest the way we're investing because of our and um, the best interests of our investors. And they use this argument over and over again to uh, justify their current investments, including those in fossil fuels and land grabs. And so Caitlin's 
rhetoric about how we can actually start to say, no, this is not in our interests, either economically or um, in terms of our lives and our planet um, could possibly work. Next slide, please, Bill. So what can we do? Um, and that's where we're gonna um, talk in more detail in our breakout groups, but um, I just wanted to give a sort of overview of some of the tactics and strategies we've used so far and that we know can work. And then we'll do some brainstorming about some other ideas that all of you might have um, to add to this list. So all of us can help to keep the pressure on TIAA by signing the online petition and by getting more people to sign the petition with you. Um, and also to get your institution to sign. So we'll talk more about how to do that. Um, we can talk more about how to do that individually, but if you're part of say a nonprofit organization um, that has TIAA, how, how might you get that group or an, environmentally, uh, an environmental group to sign on? Um, all of us can write letters to the editor um, or op-eds. Letters to the editor are short, but they're not hard to write, and I'm happy to be a point person for everybody in talking about where you want to send it, what it looks like, give you some templates. Um, so that's something all of us can do, and I hope all of us will do that. Um, then we have kind of two groups of uh, of us activists gathered. Um, there are those of us who are faculty or staff at universities or nonprofits um, and other TIAA clients. And we uh, want to gather our voices to call our TIAA reps to say, look, why don't we have better fossil free options? So they have a what they call a low carbon fund is not even low carbon um, and they do not have good a good array of socially responsible funds so we want to make sure that their client they are hearing from their clients about that on september 30th they're having a webinar and it's supposed to be just focused on giving us advice as investors but i'd love to get a bunch of us to, to be on that webinar and to say hey what about uh esg funds the second thing that faculty um and university staff can do is to get faculty uh, and staff assemblies or senates to pass resolutions pressing their universities if they're TIA clients to push TIA to divest um, and we can talk about that more in the breakout room students and activists um, and all of us can engage in direct actions targeting TIA offices and we can engage in social media campaigns. Um, and there's lots of other things that students and other activists who are not necessarily TIA clients can do. So what we're gonna do now is to go into our breakout rooms. Um, and there are really just two of them. Bill, if you could forward to the next one. Um, breakout room number one is for faculty, staff, and other TIA clients. Breakout room two is for students and activists and anybody else who's interested in joining the campaign. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit in more detail about what our tactics will be and figure out who wants to do what and then brainstorm, brainstorm some ideas for how we're going to go about um, making taking our next steps. Drew, back to you. Great. Uh, so these are our two breakout groups and Caroline sort of set them up. If you are interested in joining the first breakout group, the one for faculty, staff, and TIA clients in particular, uh, type in the chat, or uh, you can also down at the bottom, there's a little more button and you can put a reaction up. Uh, give us a little indication, wave your hands, type your name in the chat. Uh, if you wanna join the breakout group that's specifically for uh, TIA customers or potential customers, um, and we'll get everybody into that group in one second and everybody else just stay here uh, and we'll get you all over there. So give me a minute to get everybody sorted. And we're going to yell, resist, protect, divest. And before we yell, um, we will definitely be back with another big Zoominar in November. So we'll see you at the latest in November. Literally see you again. Uh, okay, so you ready to shout? Let's shout twice. Ready. Okay, everybody's unmuted. Wait, what are so we supposed to say? Resist, protect. Okay. 
Thanks everybody for participating and yelling. You can unmute yourself again if you want more one more round of resist, protect, divest. Uh, and a couple of us will stick around for just another minute or two if you have urgent updates. But thanks so much everybody for being on. Um, for the whole TII divest crew, Bill McKibben, Caitlin, and all of us. Uh, thanks for joining tonight, and we'll see you soon. We'll have follow-up emails out uh, within the next day or two, uh, including recordings of this webinar and other things. So. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great night. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye, bye Allison. Started. See you soon, Britain. Yep. <laughs>